Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first webinar of Detecting and Defending Against Cyber Threats, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Coward and I'll be your MC for this webinar and for the duration of the course. And our mentor is George Thomas. Wherever you're watching this, we hope you're safe and well. We've got a lovely George Thomas there at the beach, no doubt. Um, before we begin, just some housekeeping. Uh, all webinars for this course will be held at 7.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, with recordings made for those of you who cannot attend on a given occasion. Despite the recordings, um, if you can make it, we, we really hope you'll attend the live webinars and, and contribute to a collaborative learning environment. We quite clearly use Zoom for our webinars and encourage questions and the use of chat uh, throughout the course. We ask that you direct all questions relevant to course content to the Q&A section and that you send all administration type questions, dates, times, resource availability and the like to the support team in chat. You can chat with panellists only or to your fellow students as well. And you can make that choice by toggling through the drop down box once you've opened the chat log. There are usually some very experienced attendees who will be most helpful with any queries you may have and often their insights augment the content that we're covering. We'll have Q&A sessions at the end of the webinars and if there's any particularly relevant questions I'll, I'll definitely interrupt during George's discussion. For those of you who have never taken part in a short course with us and I can see from the introductions in the, the Moodle page um, that there's a few of you. First of all, welcome. IT Masters is a training organisation that exists as a partner to CSU exclusively. Um, we work with them to create and deliver a number of master's courses, which um, George has experienced firsthand as both a student and a teacher. Um, we also market these courses on, on CSU's behalf and hope that the best way to do that is to give some of it away free, like this. If we do a good enough job, then students will be encouraged to enrol in the full master's if it suits them. With that said, we, we absolutely want this course to be a useful and rewarding experience and exercise. Um, we want you to learn some interesting information, have some fun and hopefully make connections with some of your fellow students. I think there's about four and a half thousand to five thousand people enrolled in this course so far. So you're spoiled for choice to who to chat to. Um, and the, the forums are going to be really exciting as a result. There's already, you know, there's 600 people just listening along right now. Um, so um, the, the conversation will be rich. Hannah, as usual, is around tonight in an administrative and technical support role for IT Masters. Um, she's responsible for the, the learn.itmasters.edu.au website or the course page or the Moodle page, which we use interchangeably, which is where you find all the other materials needed for this course, links to any readings or articles, discussion forums and, and quizzes. If you have any questions tonight or later on, please feel free to contact us using the details on that page. After George's discussion, I'll talk a bit about CSU uh, tonight and try and give you an idea of what studying with us is all about and how these short courses can help you in completing a postgraduate course, if you're interested. So if you have any questions about that, just hold them over and hopefully I'll answer them then. Uh, after that, we'll have a more comprehensive Q&A on both George's and my um, presentations. And it's time to welcome George, who I'm sure some of you will know from his, his teaching. I'm pretty pumped to have him running a short course with us. It's always great to get some some new blood into these things. Um, I'm going with Dr. George Thomas, um, even though it's a bit murky as to whether the title is already conferred. Uh, George has over 20 years experience in info technology and cyber risk in Australia and the United States. Experience in heaps of different industries and heaps of industry certifications. It's, it's pretty impressive. Ch have a look at the who's teaching the course on, a, on the IT Masters site. It's pretty amazing. Um, and my favourite is he's, he's done his Masters and Doctorate with CSU and IT Masters. So it's a, a real pleasure to have him here. And please welcome George. Thank you. Um, yeah, so great to be here. Um, as Guy just pointed out, um, yeah, the, the, the doctor title is a little bit, a little bit murky. Um, I've, I've passed my thesis. It's just uh, big paperwork. Um, so, anyway, um, so yeah, everyone, welcome everybody. Um, I'm hoping that um, you know, this is going to be very sort of valuable and very relevant to uh, to all of you. Um, and so, over the next four weeks, I'll be taking through, taking you through. You know, as I said, um, what I hope is, is going to be useful. Um, these learnings come from, I guess, a combination of the ITE 534 cyber warfare and terrorism subject. Um, that's 
part of the um, IT Masters um, course in, um, I think, the Graduate Cert and the um, Masters of Cyber Security, is that right? Um, and um, offered by IT Masters and CSU, um, as well as my own research and experience as a cyber and ICT practitioner over the past 20 years or so. Uh, I'm going to pretty much skip over the about me. There's a bit of that in the end. I'm going to get stuck, kind of uh, get stuck straight in. Um, so I guess I'll start with, for those of you that, um, and I, I understand there's going to be varying levels of, uh, I guess, experience and, um, and so forth in, in this um, sort of cohort. Um, but I guess for those of you that have done the CS CISSP exam, you might be familiar or you will be familiar with the term mile wide inch deep. Um, in other words, covering a very large breadth of, uh, I guess, subject um, matter, but not into a huge amount of, of depth. And so I think what I'm planning to do in these sessions is to go fairly wide, not too wide, um, but there'll be varying depth. So some stuff will be, you know, kind of touching just beneath the surface and then in other um, instances I'll go a lot deeper and I think we're going to see a lot of that um, more sort of deeper diving in um, down in the sort of you know threat detection and and some of the demo stuff where we'll kind of get a, a lot deeper into the subject material. Um, so really exciting George sorry to interrupt we've got a we've got a poll that can um, I guess get an indication of where people are at now um, so we'll just launch that now. I reckon it's a good time. Uh, which category most accurately describes you? Um, how, how deep are you into your IT careers? Um, we've got, I've always wanted to work in IT and might as well start now. I work in IT and want to transition into a security role. I already work in IT and I'm searching for nuggets of gold. I just love IT masters and turn up to all the free content I can. Welcome. Uh, something not captured by the others. So there's 700 of you out there. Uh, 350 or so have voted so far. And by the way, George, uh, my, I guess my personal motto is inch deep and mile wide. So, so thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, funnily enough, I'm looking at the rate at which people are voting and it is quicker than most of the file copies that I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got 75% voted already. Um, yeah, it's flying up there. Um, yeah, so, so most um, already working on IT and want to transition into a security role, that's 37%. I'll end the poll there and share the results and some already working in IT security and here searching for nuggets of gold. So that's good. We've got a, a, a good sort of um, fairly experienced group. So that's pretty exciting. Cool. Exciting. And hopefully intro, the intro uh, module, which is today, um, I'm, I'm sure that's probably going to be a quite a, a bit of this that you may be familiar with. Um, having said that, I am going to do a bit of an introduction anyway, just to kind of get the lay of the land before we dig into uh, modules sort of two and three um, in terms of more of the, you know, the, the defense strategies and the more sort of technical de detection um, and so forth. So um, I will kind of go into, um, and so yeah, that was week one and then two, three, and then four, we'll recap everything. Look at where the future's going. Um, some pretty inter interesting discussions that I've been having with, um, you know, various sort of you know, academics and industry folk over the past, you know, few months about, especially with this sort of shift with everyone, well, not everyone, but a lot of people, you know, working from home due to COVID-19 um, and the potential threats that, you know, we're seeing and, and what we need to be, I guess, prepared for, um, followed by the summary and then, and then the assessment. So um, moving along. So um, the current cyber threat landscape is where I thought I would start. Uh, as I said, this is taken from my, my research, my discussions with, um, you know, my peers and with you know, academics, um, and also from the experience that I've had in the field responding to and investigating cyber threats. Um, and this is specifically over the past sort of 12 to 18 months. So even though there's probably a few years of this, this is kind of more what I'm seeing more recently. And so I thought that would be a lot more relevant. And I guess the intent was to keep these learnings um, I guess, applicable to what is happening now. And I think also it's worth noting that I, I've divided them into, well, I think that the threats can be divided into two distinct categories, which is, um, or targets, which are business corporate and then individual personal. Um, this course will focus on threats to business, um, as will the assessments and so forth. Having said that, um, you know, there may be scams or attacks that have affected individuals from time to time that may be, that may be, um, so I always start with this very, very high level. There's only one of these um, slide, which is just to do a quick overview 
um, of the world. Um, and I guess the, the ITU have estimated that there are 4.1 billion internet users at the end of 2019, which is a lot of internet users, which is you know, over half the world's population. Um, and then each year data breaches are rising um, year on year. I think one of the key things, especially in, in sort of corporate land, is that increase in legislation, regulation, and you know, working for a, a law firm, I, I get a lot of these come across my, my, my desk in terms of you know, questions about these sorts of things and compliance requirements and so forth. And so in 2018, um, you know, we had things like the Australian Notifiable, Notifiable Data Breach Scheme, um, which was an amendment to the Privacy Act. We had GDPR, so um, the General Data Protection Regulation out of the EU come into effect. Um, you know, Canada have PEPIDA. Uh, California have the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, at the time that I was leaving the US, which was around 2016, 2017, um, the, the New York Department of Financial Services had specific cyber regulation that they were implementing. And we're seeing similar things happening here with um, you know, the likes of APRA, I mean, like CPS 234. Uh, and so these types of things, and especially where there's requirements around um, you know, notifying uh, in the event of a breach, um, and, and the obligation to do so, it's really important that A, these things, are these breaches are prevented from happening, um, but B, that if it does happen and, you know, there, there's in, in the cyber industry, there's always been the, well, it's not a matter of um, if, but when, um, that, you know, detection is is something that can be, um, well, that, that, that detection is, is possible and, and that those um, sort of threats have been identified and then can be remediated and any reporting obligations are, um, are addressed. And so if we look at the um, Australian Notifiable Data Breach um, Scheme, and I understand we probably have um, people from across the globe here, um, but you know, this year alone, we had uh, 518 data breaches reported to the OAIC. Um, so, you know, it's pretty, pretty interesting time. Um, I think I did write a paper specifically around, you know, the rise of data breach laws and regulations. Um, so, yeah, very, very, very topical. Um, and so just to kind of dig straight in, um, I thought I'd talk about threat actors. And so this is really talking about where, a, the, you know, where these threats originate from. And so if we, and who's responsible. And so I thought we'd do a quick skim over this. Um, I've sort of broken it down into seven threat actor, I guess, groups. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly cover off each one of these um, and maybe even talk a little bit about, um, you know, what type of attacks they might be responsible for. Um, and so we have um, at the start organized crime. So organized crime, it's really the, that evolution, I guess, of the smash and grab. So rather than, you know, raiding warehouses and so forth, the, the idea of using cyber and the, it is a very lucrative one. Um, you all, the, the these organised crime groups also now benefit from the ability to um, commit crimes across borders, um, which does make um, issues like law enforcement, uh, or make things like law enforcement a lot more difficult when you're talking about you know cross border jurisdictions and and so forth. Um, you know, it's it, it can be less risky because you know there's the the person doesn't or the, the threat actor doesn't specifically have to be sitting right in you know there where they're committing the crime. They're often many 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 miles away. And the common attacks that that um, that we see around organised crime are things like wire fraud. So you know tricking people into transferring money to um, other to, to the wrong bank accounts and so forth. We're seeing ransomware. Um, and I will talk more in more detail about these and show you a few little examples of, um, of these attacks. And then theft of information, such as personally identifiable information, um, which, you know, like date of births, addresses, names, um, social security numbers, tax file numbers, those credit card numbers, those sorts of things, which can be used for identity theft. And I think in addition to this, the, the, the money laundering that can happen, you know, with the, the sort of uh, use of things like cryptocurrency and so forth, um, really kind of lend themselves well to, um, to uh, organized crime. So that's the first one. Um, moving on from that, we, oh, is that poll just on my screen or is that in the middle of the entire screen? I believe it's just for you. Okay. Should be able to get rid of it. Yeah, cool. Um, so, and then we have state sponsored um, attacks and, you know, the Australian um, 
Prime Minister, um, you know, had a, at his press conference earlier in the year talked about that sort of increase in in activity in Australia. Um, but obviously, this was over a certain. Uh, it, it wasn't. I think when the news came out, it kind of sounded like it had just happened. But um, more realistically, it's been happening over a certain period of time. But once again, you know, we're seeing the um, sort of state government. Um, based threat actors, um, often associated with advanced persistent threats, um, you know, a attacking, um, uh, you know, uh, governments, um, organizations and so forth. And so if we talk about some of these um, and, and, you know, I'm thinking of groups like, uh, and they, they have interesting names that are named by the security vendors, but, um, you know, I'm thinking, you know, sometimes it, it some groups out of China, for example, so APT3 is, um, one of those also known as Gothic Panda, um, you know, their, their sort of modus operandi is around, um, uh, you know, information theft and espionage. Um, and, you know, they, they sort of focus on, you know, aerospace, construction, defense, manufacturing. I mean, that's what these sort of, you know, threat intelligence is telling us, um, utilizing tools like, you know, key loggers, um, double pulsar, which, um, and eternal blue, which I'm sure many of you may have heard of, um, you know, kind of, widely used um, a couple of years back around the sort of wanna cry, pet you, not pet you attacks, um, the, the, that whole ransomware thing. Um, I believe from memory that was uh, one of the, was it, was it Shadow Brokers? Um, you know, it was, a, it was a release of some zero day exploits that came out of, um, out of the um, NSA. Um, and so, you know, groups like, you know, APT3, APT14, um, Anchor Panda. So, I think it's, uh, I think it might be FireEye, no, not FireEye, um, but ba basically one of the, you know, they, they sort of use kind of, you know, cute animals um, to sort of identify specific countries. Whereas, you know, for example, the Russians are, are known as the bears. So, you know, APT29, Cozy Bear, the Dukes, um, also around info theft and espionage. I guess the difference is different threat actors have different behaviors, which I think will be, and the reason I'm saying this now is because as we go into that sort of detection the um, sort of discussion uh, the week after next, um, we'll talk about, you know, sort of indicators of compromise and things like that. And when we do that, we, we think about, well, you know, the, the, um, the sort of, you know, panda threat actors are going to typically be a lot more quiet and a lot more silent, and they're going to sort of sit and lay dormant in there uh, for, you know, periods of time. Whereas some of the other threat actors like the bears tend to be more um, of a use more smash and grab techniques. And whilst the, um, and they'll use tools like, you know, Cobalt Strike and like Mimi Cats and things like that. Um, there's actually a group called Berserk Bear, which um, kind of frightens me a little bit. Um, but, you know, their, and their MO is sabotage and destruction. So I guess, you know, what we're, what we're, well, so I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, there's different behaviors, um, there's different, types of um, uh, sort of end games um, and, you know, different tools and, and, and threats. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about some of those IOCs, indicators of compromise and, um, you know, what to look out for, where to, you know, what sort of, what sort of sort of signatures to search for and, and also look at some defense strategies on how to protect, you know, help prevent some of these things from happening in the first place. Um, sorry, I went on a bit about that slide there. Um, the next sort of group, oh, sorry. My next thing's not working, is hacktivists. So this is um, pretty obvious there, but um, you know, hacking for a social or political cause, um, you know, often associated with groups such as um, you know, Anonymous, Chaos Computer Club out of Europe, um, Legion of Doom, Lizard Squad, you probably heard of many of these names. Um, common attacks that they do are um, you know, defacement, denial of service, um, information leakage, um, you know, and you know, examples of that is the um, you know, with the, the hacks against the, um, the the companies in the in the Arctic, um, you know, and then basically getting getting all the credentials and dumping them on Pastebin, you know, that sort of information leakage, um, or you know, taking websites down so that they no longer work. Um, so obviously, you know, these are very well known um, uh, uh, threat groups. Um, and you know, obviously, one that typically are more targeted towards social or political cause. Um, but you know, depending on what industry you're in, um, very, very um, you know, possible threat. Um, 
the other one that I'm looking at here is the the terrorists. So, and terrorism is interesting. And I think when I'm you know when I'm running IT um, five three four, there's some often often the question comes up around what is cyber terrorism, and there's typically you know more than one definition. So cyber terrorism, I guess, and based on you know, and if there's anyone from any of the two last sessions that I ran. Thinking about cyber terrorism, there's the the sort of act of committing terrorism through cyber. So, um, you know, something that instills fear, um, and, and that might be something like an attack on critical infrastructure. Um, you know, things like you know the power grids, gas pipelines, um, water treatment, that sort of thing. And obviously, that's very frightening, especially historically. Um, a lot of those sort of sort of SCADA industrial systems were not very well um, protected and maintained. Um, but the other thing is around funding of terrorism, which then leads to more of the scamming and, and, and the sort of um, wire fraud and so forth. And then the third, um, I guess, play is um, recruitment of terrorists. And so, as you can see by some of these, uh, and yeah, some of these pictures that are here, you know, you've got like Facebook groups for sort of ISIS and you've got, you know, Twitter feeds and, and, and those sorts of things. So you know, spreading um, messages through through those sort of channels. And um, yeah, so I guess that's, um, there's there's more than one way to look at how, uh, how you know, cyber terrorism um, or to define cyber terrorism. Um, <clears throat> the other one, which is the one that we probably think of the most, well, some of us uh, are the individual hackers. So the script kiddies, the lone wolf hackers, um, you know, and the petty thieves of the cyber world. So those opportunists that are, you know, just going out there to try and make a, a, a buck. Um, and once again, becomes really easy with these sort of borderless transactions and the ease of um, conducting some of these attacks. Um, and so, um, I mean, obviously it's not gonna be a baby sitting there at a computer. Well, it's a very, very smart baby. But, um, you know, these are, the, and to sort of go through these without going into too much detail, um, for those that are fairly new, I mean, script kiddies are, are the fairly unskilled um, sort of hackers where, you know, they're sort of just getting the, the tools and they're, you know, that they're downloading, maybe they're downloading a Kali Linux distribution or a Parrot and they're just kind of pointing and shooting. And um, they're actually considered quite dangerous because often when you're sort of just doing that and almost mucking around, um, you know, you can create all sorts of havoc just by not understanding completely what's going on. Um, so, you know, often they're associated with disruption and things like that. And then you kind of step into the more kind of, you know, official sort of black hat and those sort of lone wolf hackers that might, you know, create their own exploits and, and so forth. Um, and typically, and I know I've, I've written many papers and, and so forth that sort of tries to define these types of roles, but I guess ultimately that, that sort of black hat is really usually motivated by financial or, or personal gain. Um, if it's something that's more cause based, they kind of almost jump back into that sort of hacktivist um, basket. Um, anyway, um, moving on, we have the malicious insiders. So these are um, often disgruntled personnel. Um, you know, there's been a few instances of, of this um, where someone is not happy or whatnot, or, you know, can work out how to, you know, um, siphon off money or something like that or you know get access to confidential information and commit insider trades um that's the sort of you know malicious insider and th these start to become difficult because this is where you're starting to look at things like behavioral um and uh, in addition to your normal sort of controls but looking at behaviors and and analysis of behaviors and it becomes um, a little bit more tricky but we will cover that off a bit later on um and then in some instances the the whole threat actor infiltration so planting somebody into an organization for the purposes of committing a malicious act. Um, so they're malicious insiders. And the last one are the accidental insiders. So these are definitely worth a mention. I mean, I think that um, there's probably quite a lot of these. Um, so these, these particular threat actors aren't malicious. Um, they're, they, they just, had a bit of a whoopsie moment, I think, in many cases, or or just not kind of, you know, they just something's happened where, and it could be anything from a, you know, an email auto complete fail to you know losing a device and 
probably not reporting it to, you know, the probably most common one, which is clicking on a phishing link. Um, often these accidental insiders, um, you know, they're, they're, they're doing things that sometimes, uh, and this is, this, this, these could be anybody. Sometimes it might just be a case of they're trying to circumvent um, the way things are because they want to get something done, but it, it you know, actually creates a bigger risk. Um, and that's where we, you know, you sort of think about things like shadow IT and so forth. And so um, definitely a real risk, um, pretty hard to control. Um, well, when I say pretty hard to control, they are controllable, but you know, th th they're sort of taking a different perspective on it because you're looking from the inside out rather than maybe what might be coming outside in. Um, so, um, oh, and the OAIC uh, basically reported from January to June um, this year that 34% of breaches reported to the OAIC were as a result of um, you know, these types of um, of these types of um, threat. Just a question without notice, George, is, is that sort of uh, a fairly standard percentage or is it sort of becoming more prevalent or less? Um, from memory, I think it's pretty standard. Um, right, so it's just so, the way it goes. Yeah, and like I said, it's accidental. So it's not like someone's just, you know, otherwise it becomes malicious, right? So it's just silly things. Like, as I said, it's sending to the wrong, you know, sending confidential data to, and especially with these privacy um, legislation and, regu and regulations that are happening where, you know, someone might have a file that has PII in it um, and they send it to the wrong recipient. Now, there are some sort of other considerations around there where if, you know, you, you know, if, if you contact the sender and, and maybe talk to a lawyer about this one, but if you contact the person that was the recipient and you ask them to delete it and you have, you know, a, um, a warm and fuzzy feeling, but you, you believe that it's, that it's, that it's been deleted, um, that, you know, there, that there might be some different reporting obligations, but um, it, it, it really depends. But, um, you know, these are really just sort of accidental things, you know, leaving a laptop that has, um, you know, that's, or, or a phone um, that, I'm going to say this by saying a lot of these devices now have protections on them, but let's say they don't and they're left in the back of a cab or even if it's paper, right? And it's a file, a folder full of, you know, um, confidential information left in the back of a, of a cab. I mean, these are, these are those kind of accidental scenarios. So, you know, it happens and I think it's always happened, but now there's a, a sort of requirement to report it um, in, depending on, you know, if, um, and, and I don't have the, 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 the regulation in front of me or the legislation in front of me, but you know, if there's a, a, a sort of view that it will cause significant harm to, to an individual, individual. So um, yeah, that's, uh, as a, that's a new requirement from, in terms of Australia from a, a couple of years ago. Thanks. Um, just, just before you go on, um, we're getting a bit wild in the chat. Um, just, just to straighten you off a bit, if you have any questions, feel free to chuck them in. Um, if you're sending things like Bitcoin wallets in the chat, that's not appropriate and we'll have to shut you down. But, um, but by all means, sort of tell, uh, augment the content by telling your stories. Um, tell us what your experience of these things is and give us preferences around tools that you use. That's the sort of stuff we want in the chat. Um, uh, for those that are upset about it, it, it'll settle down. It always does. Um, there's 800 people here and, and we'll just sort it out as we go. And there'll be a, a bit of a self-policing thing coming along soon. Cool. Um, and so I guess moving on. So one of the key things with many of these attacks is the issues around attribution. Um, and I guess, you know, sometimes threat actors will say it was me. Uh, for example, the Save the Arctic campaign, as you can see here, uh, where, you know, Anonymous made it pretty obvious that it was them. Um, but, you know, from, but from what a lot of the attacks that I'm seeing um, when I'm doing these investigations, the, um, the, the modus operandi is the same as is a lot of the source IP information. So they look like they're coming from the same sort of set of compromised servers. Um, but I guess one of the key things around the attribution is that, uh, and so, and I've been asked many times around, well, you know, why can't we just kind of hack them back? And I think one of the, and I think I did write a paper on this too, but one, one of the um, sort of ethical issues there is that are you actually hacking back the threat actor or, or just someone else's system that they've compromised? Um, especially obviously when no one claims responsibility. So this is definitely an issue and it's obviously an issue when it comes to enforcing, um, you know, any type of, of law enforcement type of activities because it can be difficult 
to understand um, where these attacks are coming from. Um, so moving on, um, I'm going to go over some common threats. So these are the ones that, as I said, I've been seeing in the past sort of um, 12 to 18 months. Um, to be honest, there's probably really only three of them that kind of pop up. Um, here they are. Um, and but what's interesting is they're kind of like evolutions of other like previous styles of attacks. And so I will, and I'll just, I'll cover it very quickly, but like, for example, ransomware, ransomware has evolved um, in terms of how those attacks are taking place. And now they're sort of being combined with more traditional direct hack attacks where someone you know, hacks into a system and then does something, but now they're obviously going in there and putting ransomware, but I'll cover that off on the ransomware slide. So the three types of key attacks that uh, I see presently um, um, and which will be the ones of focus over the next sort of you know, couple of weeks are those that um, uh, are business email compromise. Um, and I will go into what these are for those that are familiar, wire fraud, um, and then ransomware attacks. Um, and as I said, our, our detection and, and defense strategies will probably do a lot around this, but just because we're gonna focus on this Mean, doesn't mean that they're not applicable to other types of attacks because they definitely are. Um, so business email compromise usually starts with a, a, a phishing email. Um, and in short, what happens is, uh, and, and it could be a, um, a targeted attack or it could be an opportunistic attack. And so what happens is the threat actor um, will send an email to a, to a recipient um, the threat actor, uh, so the recipient will receive the email, they'll think it's legitimate, um, they'll open it up. Um, and what will happen then is they'll probably plug in some, you know, login details, um, which will then get sent back to the threat actor, at which point the threat actor then accesses the mailbox and then has the ability to look through the mail, you know, intercept any communications, use that mailbox to conduct any additional attacks. And in many instances, will do something like conducting wire fraud. Um, and so I'm just gonna go to this next slide. Um, and so what often happens is the, this, this business email compromise scenario comes from like a, uh, someone that you know, the recipient probably considers as a trusted sender or a, a trusted platform. Um, and I, I will go forwards and then backwards. But um, so in this instance here, you know, we see that, you know, there's a trusted sender, This guy called David, um, his last name shall be nameless, but you know, he sent it to this other person who um, knows him and then, autom you know, it, it, it lets their guard down because they think, oh yeah, I know who this is and they, they click on it. Um, th that's the top left one. The one below that, um, you know, that's actually an embedded image that's meant to look like an attachment. It's coming from someone that they know. Once again, they click it. Um, the one on the right is, um, you know, a Dropbox. So what's happened is as, you know, email systems evolve and, and the, the ability to detect malware and those sorts of things um, blocks malicious attachments, threat actors are now going, well, we'll just put those, um, those, those attachments into something like Dropbox. Um, and then you click through, you go into Dropbox, you open it up and then it sort of tells you, oh, you need to display login details. Um, but because it's, so far it seems legit, um, for, for many um, that, you know, are sort of not aware, um, there's, there's definitely a, a potential there for the, the, the capture of credentials and, and you know, some sort of malicious activity to take place. Um, so the, the two bottom ones are interesting in that, um, and th so all of these are ones that I've literally dealt with, right? So I've had to harvest these out, that's why they're all kind of like redacted. Um, but you know, the one on the right, the bottom right there was actually one of those scenarios where the threat actor got into the mailbox. They then sent an email um, with the signature, that's why there's a giant black square, of that person to a trusted, re to a recipient that they knew. And um, what happened then was, you know, follow the bouncy ball. Oh yeah, I know what that is. Oh, I know that person, I trust them. Um, and then subsequently moving on from that, um, they, they then um, got access to the mailbox. Um, and obviously I know many of you are probably seeing they're going, well, we'll just turn on MFA and we will get to that. Um, but you know, in many instances it's not on um, and it's not on by default um, in, in, these, in a lot of these platforms. And to be completely honest, you know, the Office 365 platform has been a massive target for this sort of thing because of you know, the, uh, the um, adoption of it by organizations. And don't get me wrong, it's a great platform and it works really well, but 
the fact that it's not on to start with, you know, that it's a bit of a, a gap, uh, but you know, people are sort of shifting that way. Um, so as I said, you know, coming back to this diagram here, attacker sends an email, opens it, fills, it um, fills, you know, fills the form in, goes back to the attacker, attacker uses the credentials. Um, the other thing that um, happens is the, and I thought I had a picture of it here somewhere, but once they're in, they usually create rules that prevent um, alerting, um, alerting back to the um, mailbox owner that an attack may have taken place. Um, and I'm sure it's in here somewhere. Actually, I think it's after this. So, and, and this is where we kind of go into this, this wire fraud scenario. And so wire fraud is most often associated with the business email compromise. The threat actor um, you know, intercepts an email chain, sends fake invoices, requests bank account change details. Um, I have actually seen this being conducted through the post, which I thought was pretty um, old school, but um, it happens. Um, you know, got the letterhead and, you know, just writing, and, and it seems really official when it's like in the post. Um, so I've seen that too. But in these sorts of examples, what's often seen is like you see this forwarding here. So there's a forwarding rule where the threat actor will create a rule so that things that say pay, payment, invoice, remittance, they usually also add the words hacker, hacked, breached, um, compromised. Those emails that contain that in the subject of body get moved off into a folder that's often not checked, like in this instance, RSS feeds or junk email. And, and then a copy is forwarded to an external email address. Um, and we will talk about, you know, some sort of, uh, best practices to prevent this sort of thing from working. But what ultimately happens here is that, um, you know, the the email gets sent to the accounts department um, and then, you know, they might write back, oh, you know, we've sent payment. Um, and, and what happens is the, the, the threat actor is intercepting and responding on behalf of that person. And this is all happening under the nose of the person that's been compromised, but they have no idea. And then if anyone tries to alert them, they don't get the alerts. So this is very, very common. Um, we see this a lot, um, but yeah, definitely something that um, people, um, what well, that people fall victim to quite, quite often. So see a lot of these. Um, ransomware is probably the last one I'll just quickly cover off. So historically it came from, you know, email malware. I remember if anyone remembers like the Locky type ransomware that was a few years ago. Um, more recently, this has changed. And I think probably in the last 12 to 18 months, I've started, and, and this is because email systems are stripping off any of these dodgy attachments. So what's happening now is threat actors are either, you know, using phishing or they're um, using things like, you know, being able to see exposed terminal servers and they're like brute forcing them and gaining access through traditional hacking methods into systems. And then what they're doing is they're deploying ransomware on those systems. Um, encrypting the systems. And that's kind of what happened about 12, sort of 12 months ago. Um, and then they sent you to ransom and the ransom was like, you know, point X of a Bitcoin, which was like, you know, a thousand dollars and, you know, didn't seem like a huge amount. There was a whole argument about whether you paid or not. Um, but, you know, it was a fairly small amount. This is now in the last sort of what, maybe six months become far more lucrative where the ransoms have increased, exfiltration has occurred. And now what we're seeing is data, the the data being held to ransom. So not only is it a case of, well, it's encrypted, but if the threat act is not paid, um, there's a threat to, to leak the information. And so we've seen that in a number of cases um, in the last sort of, you know, few months. Um, and in, in some instances, you know, the, the companies have paid it. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Garmin user. Um, my, I don't know if anyone else is, but my Garmin went kaput for a couple of weeks there. Um, and um, it did come back. I think the reports are that they did pay the ransom. Well, they must have, because I mean, all my data came back um, and it was out for, for, for about three weeks. Um, but, you know, these are the sorts of things that are going on. And what happens, and when I've seen these, um, you know, there's usually all the files look like this, encrypt me for .text crypt or whatever, and different types of extensions. And then they leave a, you know, little notepad file that says like, read me. And it contains what you see down the bottom there. Um, the the red, oops, you've been encrypted is probably a bit further back, um, you know, probably about a year or 18 months ago, but now it's more a case of encrypted files, text file, um, and um, and a contact me to, you know, get some decryption. And the attackers, are, they tend to be quite polite. And in many instances, they'll, they'll actually provide some advice on how to secure your system for, for next time. So oh, that's good of them. 
It is good of them. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in a really sort of twisted way. Um, but yeah, so the, that's pretty much the, the quick in, what was a quick introduction, 40 odd minute introduction um, on this. Um, I think just some quick readings um, to take a look at. Some of the ATP groups, really interesting to look at some of those. Um, and we know they originate some of their tactics and techniques. So anyone that hasn't seen it, I know if there's a, um, I mean, this was a big report in the US, but it's still quite valuable. It shows the different types of attack vectors and so forth, which is the Verizon um, DBIR report. Um, it's a free download. You could just grab it for the last, you know, for this year and the previous years, but take a look at, at, at that. So um, I think that's pretty much what I've got for today. I don't, I think I'll save some time for questions and so forth. So. Beauty, thanks so much. Um, excellent introduction. That's going to be really useful for, for those that were just thinking about joining in. Um, and hopefully we'll get into a bit of a deeper dive for those of you who have already got it covered. Um, and yeah, we just try and tailor it for as, as wide a group as possible. So that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a, a chat about CSU now. Um, so I'll have to pinch control of the screen and try and um, figure out how to do some actual presenting, uh, which is not something I'm too comfortable with. So I'll, I'll grab it off here now, um, George, and I'll start sharing my little CSU info thingamajig. And I've only got the one screen, so I don't know how to do the presentation and actually have my notes. So I'll just do it like this. So you should be able to see my presentation. Is that right? Can you see that, George? Uh, I can, and I could see all your notes. Beauty. Excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. So uh, I could just let you read it, but instead I'll, I'll read it myself. Um, I, I tend to think that we need to make the case for formal education um, before telling you to study with us. <laughs> um, and I'm going, like, I've assumed that most of you have invested, you know, like the means and the ends into working in IT. You, you both enjoy IT and can see it as a good idea. Um, and I think that once you get into study, like it's an ends in itself. I really love the idea of education as its own reward, but you know, you need to sort of think about how you're going to use the education. So I tend to talk about that in terms of jobs. So the screen, the screen grab on the right is pretty typical um, of job requirements. Um, you know, it's, 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 a fairly advanced, I think, operational role. Um, I got it from Seek for a couple of months ago for another presentation. But, you know, all, even the, even the entry level jobs require something similar. And George, feel free to jump in here because I know you'd be a lot of, you know, you'd have a lot more experience in terms of actually applying for jobs and hiring and those sorts of things. But I reckon that it's, it's not impossible to get gigs without a degree, but you need to think about whether, you know, not having that degree is, is the right idea for you, whether, um, you need to make a, a jump in the career um, and you have to be realistic about what sort of sacrifices are possible for you. Um, most of the people I talk to in, I guess my sales role is um, uh, uh, aren't in a position to, to take a backward step um, to go forward long-term and the job is to find the workarounds and to make sure it's something useful for everyone. So I won't talk about, uh, yeah, go, go, go ahead, George. Oh, no, what I was going to say, and I think that's fairly common. And I saw that it was obviously quite a fairly um, big percentage of people that are, you know, making that move um, from, you know, potentially IT specific to security. Mm. Um, and I, and that, I mean, that's been, I mean, I did it, right? I mean, I did it. So, um, and I will say, I mean, I didn't have to go backwards. I kind of had to go sideways and then forwards, which was great. Um, but certainly, you know, doing the, the, the security specific certifications and courses and, and, and those sorts of things really, really helped. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, I think I'd always been in a sort of security engineer type role, but it was still very IT specific and then making that leap over into pure cyber. Um, you know, it's something that's really common in the industry. Um, and yeah, I, I think that, you know, having those skills and, and doing those, um, you know, courses and those sorts of things to um, um, have been, a, for me, have been a really, really big help. I know that I, I went and sat, um, my first exam that I sat was the, the, the SISM exam. I think there's actually one of the short courses on that in here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I tell you what, when I did it, it was still like the little color in the circles um, 
Scantron. And I think the, it was actually a pretty hard exam um, made harder by the fact that I was getting cramps in my fingers. Um, <laughs> but it really, um, it really kind of opened up doors um, for me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a false dichotomy, I think, uh, as it says here in the notes, you know, people talk about, do I need to do one or the other? Um, and, and the sort of going backwards that I'm talking about is for those of you who aren't working in IT and might have, you know, like a, a job that's been put in jeopardy with COVID or with changing, I guess, um, changing work practices. Um, often you'll have already, you know, invested so much time in, in a particular field that um, you might not actually be able to take that backward step. So you might need to continue working if you can or work in, you know, your existing industry as you're looking to transition to a new one. So there's heaps of different ways you can go about it. Um, and heaps of different ways, as George has been alluding to, if you're already within IT, you know, you can transition to a more security focused role or do the certificates at the same time as studying to do that. Um, if you're starting out, it might be worth studying with mentors like George before paying for certifications and courses. But if you do go down the, the certification track, you'll, you'll be able to get credit for it if you want to study later. Um, I just don't think you need to focus on one or the other. Um, and if you do, you'll probably reach a ceiling pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, I've already covered most of that. Um, so, you know, given, you know, that it's a good idea to study, uh, formally. Um, I think it's a good idea uh, to study with CSU and, and IT masters and I hope George does too. Um, but I, I really believe that, you know, the, the, the best thing about us is um, the way we can take, I guess, our understanding of, of the course that we've made, um, the industry largely, and, and, you know, hopefully the adoption of, of good practices in terms of supporting you. Um, you know, we can, we can, find good teachers and we can we can get good outcomes for you i think it's really important to not only teach people about it but also to teach people about applying what they learn at work oh sorry at, at school in the work setting um, um so, so i hear a few bit these days um from whatever you want to call him dan andrews uh, you can have a hundred experts in a room with 100 opinions but at some point you just need to make a call um, or help someone else to make the call and, and then implement your strategy. Um, so I think hearing the various stories of industry-based mentors like George, as well as the, I guess, the theoretical positions of the CSU academics really does provide good insights um, into what it's actually going to be like. And you can actually get job ready graduates as opposed to people that have all of this knowledge in their head, but get into the workplace and, and don't necessarily know what to do with it and, and what to expect. Um, also, I, I think this is my little bugbear. Support staff are undervalued in tertiary education broadly. I'm just going to say it. Um, and you can see that, I think, in the, the sorts of jobs that are going in, in the university sector. Um, it's in the news now, uh, but it's not a new phenomenon. Um, yeah, I just don't think we take advantage of the, the chance that we have um, to, to find the best choices for students within the course that they're interested in. Um, some people might think it sounds simple but it really isn't um, and, and I like to think that IT masters prides itself on, on making sure that work gets done um, you know there's no one right way to study there's no run one right course structure it's just about what you want why you want it and and maybe getting some advice on what you should want because if you're you know thinking about taking the next step or going somewhere different with your career well you might not have all of the information but but we can certainly help Uh, yeah, so there's a bunch of different steps you can take and sort of um, other benefits that aren't just those major ones. Um, you can, I'll just read it out here, um, entry into the grad cert without a degree or industry background. Um, um, yeah, for, for whether you were at the, the low end of the experience or, or not, um, you know, there's always a way. Um, if you have a, a bachelor's degree, you can start with a master's, but if you don't, then you can start with a graduate certificate. Um, so it's just the first four subjects of the masters, particularly good idea if you're looking at jumping in quickly. Um, as I've been intimating that all universities are desperate for students at the moment. Um, so don't worry about whether you're eligible or not you are. Um, but we just need to make sure that we're not setting people up to fail. And that's where these short courses come in. You can sort of assess our method of delivery, um, the, the sort of stuff we want to talk about. And, and I think crucially, you know, I guess just get an idea of, 
of where we sit on, on what the right way to, to look after students is and, and what the purpose of, of getting into the study is about. Um, so yeah, if you limited technical background, not a handicap. And if you have existing knowledge, then we'll, we'll try and find credit for you. Um, you know, if you, for example, as you, as George does have the, if you have the SISM certification, that's a credit straight away in the cybersecurity courses um, for a subject called cybersecurity management. Um, you know, there's so many certifications out there, um, some better than others and some, you know, carrying more cost than others. And, and um, you can really sort of tailor, I guess, and target particular certifications to assist the study or the other way around, because a lot of the subjects are sort of based on, you know, the certifications that you're going to need out of the course. So you can, you can totally look at it that way as well. Um, and yeah, just, I know it's a tough year. Um, so, so I, I, and it's pretty crazy. And a lot of people are thinking about what the hell's going to happen over the next you know, couple of years as we come out of this COVID scenario. Um, and yeah, just because you can do something now um, doesn't mean you can, you'll be able to do it later um, in terms of, you know, like uh, it's really important to, to make sure that we keep things flexible for students. You can pick up more subjects, you can drop subjects, you can take leaves of absence if you need to, if you get a new job, if you, if you, you lose your existing job, like life gets in the way and we know that. And that's part of that, I guess, student support. If you get on the front foot you, and if we build strong relationships, we'll be able to, to really make sure that you can get the most out of your course. And that's, I guess, if there's one takeaway message, it's, it's that we're pretty committed to doing that. And, and we just want to make sure that we're setting people up to, to do the things that they want to do. So there's a bunch of different links that uh, we'll send around and we'll put these on the course page. Um, information on, on pathways, uh, a much longer and I think better version <laughs> of this little presentation. Um, send me info on return on investment, which is really important for some people. Um, and, and, you know, there's clear evidence that, you know, if you pay the, the extra cost for the, the, the postgrad study, you know, you're going to get a, a greater income. And if it's depending on where you are in your career, it's probably going to be a smart idea. And for those of you who are looking at to mitigate the time and cost associated with study, then you can get an assessment of eligibility for credit eligibility for, for the course. In most cases you, you will be eligible, but a lot of you will actually be eligible for, for credits from your experience, um, from, from short courses, you can get a credit for three short courses or for any certifications. So, so there's all sorts of information out there um, and have a look. And if you, if you want to get in touch with us, please do. Um, I'll stop sharing now, uh, George, and we can chuck your slides back up if that's all right. And um, yeah, so, I'm really excited to hear basically about what's coming up in the next few weeks and then we'll get into the Q and a session. Um, it's going to be really exciting. I think we're going to get our hands a bit dirty in the later weeks. So is that right, George? Sorry, I was looking for my mute button. <laughs> um, I've got a lot of windows open for some reason. Um, yeah. So what was the question? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, what, are we, so, yeah, what are we up to for the next few weeks? I guess it's, it's a good start. Yeah, so I, I guess, uh, and I, I, I guess we could go all the way back to the start slide there. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, whatever. Um, so I guess the next next week, we're probably going to talk more around some of the defensive strategies. Um, you know, look at, I, and I guess the, the idea is to apply them to what, um, what, a, what sort of threats we're currently seeing, um, as well as those that, I guess, from, as I said, some discussions and research and, and you know, talking with peers and, and so forth look like, uh, you know, on the, on the rise. Um, so we're going to do that next week. So it's really a, a bit of a, a, a defensive type, um, uh, I guess, session um, looking at, you know, different, I guess, frameworks, standards as well. So touching on that a little bit, um, obviously I don't want to make it too boring and you know, we're not going to go through all 114 controls of ISO 27001. <laughs> oh, no. But, no, <laughs> but we might talk about things like, you know, um, you know, potentially, um, you know, app whitelisting or um, around, you know, advanced EDR and, and things like that um, to, um, and, and look at both, you know, obviously some, you know, potentially paid and free tools and things like that. Um, and then the following week is probably going to be more based around those sort of detection. And, and so that's going to be interesting because, you know, where we're looking at, 
you know, identifying indicators of compromise um, within systems. And, and then I think what I'm planning to do in week four is kind of bring it all together. And so we'll do a quick summary, but then take one of those um, threats as an example and say, well, let's do this thing now, right? So let's uh, try and attack this, this network. When I say this network, I mean this network that is contained that doesn't actually belong to anybody but me. Um, and, you know, sort of demonstrate how, as these things happen, how these particular tools might help detect or prevent um, that type of attack. So that's the sort of week four um, thing, kind of bring it all together in a more practical sense. So I, I guess I just want to make note that this whole thing, this whole sort of three, four weeks, four weeks, isn't just going to be you listening to me waffle on and, and look at, you know, death by PowerPoint. I kind of want to sort of show, put a little bit of a show and tell and sort of say, you know, this is, this is how it is. I and mean, we're not going to run through configuring a file or anything like that, but, you know, sort of um, make it a little, a little bit more interactive as much as I can with you know, a, a group of this size. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the, that's the plan. No, it sounds really exciting. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a good plan. Uh, so we're pretty much on the hour now, but we've got a load of questions. Um, we got through all the, the CSU marketing spiel and sorry for all that. <laughs> uh, so I reckon we'll, we'll start whipping through the questions, George. I'll just put them to you. Um, and you know, some I might not actually, I uh, have too much of an idea of what they're talking about because I'm not that technical, but um, we'll, we'll try our best. Um, and yeah, so uh, for all of you listening along, um, there's a lot of questions throughout the chat and throughout the webinar um, about you know, the details of the course. It'll all be available on the course page at the, at the, at the Moodle page, learn.itmasters.edu.au. Um, but just, just briefly, every module uh, has a quiz associated with it. And you'll need to pass that quiz as a hurdle requirement to be able to unlock the exam. The exam will be a 50% pass rate, but we won't really, it's honestly the, the, the assessment of this course is probably like the least important part of the course. The, the important thing is to just get the content, to have a bit of fun learning about it and to, to make some connections with some hopefully new mates on the forum. Um, and then we get a certificate at the end of it once we've got all that. That's just, you know, just something to pad the resume. And, and hopefully if you're keen on doing some paid study get some credit down the track but um so so don't worry too much about all those sorts of details let's just really rip into the the, the theory and the content so george um i've got a couple of quick questions from shantuna shantanu sorry uh what are the best mobile raspberry pi and laptop uh, library providers that we can use to secure apps on these platforms that's a very technical question bit too technical or, or? Uh, uh, yeah, probably without kind of a bit more research. So hang on, what, what are the best mobile Raspberry Pi and laptop? Yeah, that's probably a little bit without okay. actually. Yeah. Probably. Well, if it's really technical, this is a perfect example, George, of a question that can go into the forum. Um, yeah. Does anyone have the answer to that? Yeah. So, so Shantanu, if you, if you do want to chuck that question in the forum, that's, that's the perfect example of you know, getting a, a broader um, range of experience levels, helping each other out. So um, maybe we'll, we'll use that as the answer for this one as a really good paradigm paradigmatic case and of that. Um, but something like, could you cover the hacker versus cracker definitions might be. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, um, I, mean, I think as I alluded to, the definitions are always a little bit, bit fuzzy. I mean, one of the things that seems to come up a lot is, um, and I think I did see some chatter about it in the forum was, you know, talking about, um, you, you know, the sort of, uh, what do you call it, like the hacktivists and then, you know, what, what is a gray hat and, and those sorts of things. But I guess effectively, if you look at, you know, hackers and the, t the term hacker, um, which dates back to, I think it was the, I did put this, it's in one of my papers that I, I remember it was for like 1960s. <laughs> I think it was 1960s. I think it was coined um, in maybe MIT or somewhere. And so the idea between, I guess, a hacker in the true sense was someone that was able to get a computer system or, or something to do something that it wasn't intended to do. Um, and so I think if we look at, you know, the, the term cracker and talk about intent and feel free anyone to correct me, but my understanding is the cracker is more, you know, like a black hat um, hacker is really more of a, a, a kind of thought about it as a cracker because what they're doing is they're, you know, they're, they operate illegally um, and obviously a hacker could too, but, more so around their motives and, and being able to, you know, physically, well, not physically, but like, you know, break 
um, systems and, and you know break code and those sorts of things. So um, I think there's a really good definition of it. In it might be it might be one of the um, might even be the CEH book. Um, but yeah, the, the, the I guess you know hackers tend to be almost anybody could be technically a hacker. Um, mm. They're just trying to you know get something to do something it wasn't intended to do. Whereas a cracker has a far more malicious intent. Mm. Um, that was my understanding, but. Yeah, and, and think for, of a better reason, except when it's just popped <laughs> out the top of my head. Yep. And uh, for those uh, who aren't in the know, CEH is Certified Ethical Hacker, a, a certification that you can get um, in the industry. Thank you. I was uh, going to say, is there a, a thing for that too? Where if you've got that, you can... Yeah, totally. That's a subject credit as okay. well. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, ITE 516 Hacking Countermeasures. Uh, Similar question for me, yes, and I, I saw him ask, or I saw them ask that in the chat quite a bit. How is hacktivism different to cyber terrorism? Again, a, a definition question, but yeah. So a lot of these things come down to motive, in, in sort of in my, from from what I understand. So hacktivism um, is really around the motive based on, I guess, social or political cause, as I as I mentioned before, um, whereas terrorism and I, and I think it's a good question because there's a very thin line um, you know terrorism is really designed around instilling fear um, and and, and I, I think that maybe what the, the question is being asked because you know often you know terrorists uh, are driven by some sort of causal belief um, so I guess when we think about that um, you know, it's really, once again, really hard to define, but I think we think of terrorism as, you know, far more destructive and, and far more fear inducing um, than hacktivism. And the, I guess the, the, um, I guess the, the motive behind it is not too indifferent, but a little bit <laughs> different. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know all these definitions today? <laughs> um, but yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, but that's kind of my, my view on it. So, yeah. and these would all be contested, wouldn't they? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying I'm the, you know, the, the dictionary on, on these <laughs> definitions. Um, but that's my understanding of it. So, um, you know, it, but yeah, I, I do get that they could be defined very in a very similar fashion. Um, mm. yeah. And another, another good forum chat. <laughs> Uh, Wesley Fox has asked, is CompTIA Security Plus credited? Yes, it is uh, in the security courses. Uh, so I'll just get rid of that one straight away. Um, and actually we're, we're already over time. So we'll just go through the questions, which is really great and feel free to, to hang around for as long as you can and want to. Um, but maybe Hannah, if you can start cutting questions off now, we'll, we'll take no more questions because otherwise we'll be here all night, which is fun. Um, so, I'll go back up. Uh, do you do hackathons, George? Do I do hackathons? Yeah. Um, I used to do like capture the flags and stuff, but not recently. Um, yeah, I've sort of stepped away from a lot of the more technical stuff, I think, because I like sleep. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I guess historically, you know, I've, I've won a couple sort of, you know, capture the flag type things. Um, you know, when I oh, look even five years ago when I did, um, I think it was uh, one of the SANS courses, um, mm. continuous monitoring security. I got the capture the flag and then the little, um, you know, that can win the, like the coin um, for that sort of thing. Um, I know that some of my team go do um, like, there's like the, like, sort of like you know, the boss of the sock type stuff. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I sort of step away from that where I can, I don't have time. Do you, do you miss the technical stuff or, or do you like the management? Um, I still like to have a, a, a foot in the technical realm, um, but only to the point where I still understand it, not necessarily sitting there mucking around with stuff at three o'clock in the morning, mm. um, which usually started at like, you know, 5 p.m., but I was just, it just continued on and then suddenly it's like, oh, the sun's coming up. Um, not that that <laughs> happened often, but it did happen a couple of times in you know, the sort of past 20 years. So, yeah, I still like to keep that part of my mind alive um, just so that I know that, you know, if there's a decision that I need to make um, what, you know, what the implications are and so that I understand what my team um, are working with and, and to sort of, you know, and help them if I can. But um, yeah, I'm sort of blended, I guess. 
Great. Uh, Bridget's got a question about um, preferences um, or, or not, no, or lists. Um, so any questions about preferences and lists, I, I sort of prefer to get chucked in the forum, especially when we've got so many people, because there's just so many different um, uh, perspectives. Um, but you mentioned Mimi Cats and Cobalt Strike. Um, is it possible to have a list of the attack tools and their purpose? If, uh, you know, like I, I wonder, are there any sort of useful um, uh, there, there are some definitely some public sources of that. Um, there are a lot of them. Um, I don't think there's going to be a list that has all of them, but definitely the more common ones, um, you know, that's probably something that I could track down pretty easily and share it in a, in a forum. Um, yeah. um, you know, like for example, the, the Kali distribution or Parrot, they, you know, they've got a whole bunch of them in there, which they actually nicely categorize into folders. Um, mm. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, that that's, pretty easy. I mean, it's, it's a big list, um, but yeah, happy to track one of those down. Well, that, that, that's the sort of thing I'd say, let's, let's throw that to the group and just sort of, again, chuck it in the forum. And um, if you have any thoughts, uh, any good lists, any good resources, and this goes for all sorts of lists and, and tools and preferences and um, yeah, whatever you got going, love to hear it. Uh, okay. We've got, Grant has asked a question that I can probably take. Um, are there mentorships such as ones available in organizations like AIPM and ACS? Is that, actually, I don't know what, Grant, if you could maybe type that in again and sort of um, maybe add a bit more context, that'd be great. Um, we've had a couple of questions about um, insiders. Um, Tahir's asked what sort of training required for accidental insider training so these breaches can be minimized um do you how do you minimize the insider threat in an organization yeah that's a i wish i had the magic answer for that <laughs> um look I, and i and i think like everything in um cyber um it's around um almost it's like a it's like a risk-based sort of process and that sounds very textbook of me but really you know trying to identify what sort of issues there are and whether it's worth solving that sort of whether it's solving that that risk so you know obviously training is a good one i mean that 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 helps solve a lot of the helps it doesn't it's not bulletproof but you know things like that the clicking on phishing and bad links and all that sort of stuff i mean that's you know that's partially solvable um i'd say i like to say fully solvable it's not but through the use of things like um uh, security awareness training and, and that sort of thing um certainly there are you know tools that can um, you know, help detect, um, you know, things like accidental emails to the wrong participants or using things like, you know, mail tips to say, you know, this is an external email and that, and lots of organizations are doing that. So, you know, when an email comes in from an external, they'll say it's external, or sometimes when an organization comes in from an, or an email comes in from an external, but there's, there's a person internal with the same name, it puts a big stamp that says this is external just so that it's, you know, it helps to try and, um, mitigate that threat a little bit to say, okay, well, this might be a spoofed, um, you know, an impersonated email. Um, I, I think training is the big one. Um, obviously policies are great, but then you kind of need, so policies are good too, but then you need supporting controls. And we will talk a little bit about that. Um, I know that in, in the organization that I work in, you know, we, we restrict the ability to do a lot of things like uploading to, you know, cloud storage and, and there's, you know, data leakage prevention controls and things like that. Um, once again, it's kind of finding that balance. I mean, nothing is going to ever be really perfect. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise it probably becomes unusable or it's just cost prohibitive, but yeah, from, you know, tools like, you know, DLP, CASB, and once again, I, I, I'm not saying go and buy all these things, um, you know, policies, training, it, it's that multi-layered approach, which I'm sure, you know, many of you have heard before doing that sort of, you know, layered defense, that's kind of what needs to happen um, from both an external and internal threat perspective. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, no silver bullet. <laughs> what a shame. Uh, it's been a job, so. <laughs> yeah, and that's the interesting thing, isn't it? You know, ideally, we'd all make cybersecurity redundant but um it's like you know why why you know why isn't software perfect why do i need to patch it well you know because then there's no room for improvement right so <laughs> yeah uh question couple of questions on ransomware um are ransomware hackers from certain parts of the world and i guess on top of that you know um 
what are the implications if yes um and when when a victim or when victims pay for ransomware how often are the malicious actors you know sticking to their commitment not to not to do anything naughty afterwards yeah so the question there about certain parts of the world so the first thing there is it's um it, it's the yeah, the well, we we th we think yes um um and we we think that for many of these threats they come from certain parts of the world but um as I, as we've alluded to before and someone's you know we've talked about um attribution it can be difficult because you don't know if that's truly where the threat actor is coming from um you know there's a lot of kind of i guess consensus that you know that some of these groups may originate from you know eastern parts of europe and and, and so forth and from you know parts of asia and that sort of thing um but once again it really comes down to whether anyone's going to claim um claim that it was them um but you know if i think about some of the um you know some of the business email compromise attacks i mean they all almost all of them look like they're coming from um from um the african continent so nearly all of them um so w once again you know are they coming from there maybe maybe not but um i think that's kind of the best guess and obviously yeah, the 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 challenge there is um a identification and b whether you can do anything about it because of you know cross border um uh, cross cross border uh, jurisdiction issues um, but yeah, uh, they, they seem to follow a similar um, MO. Um, they, the source IPs for, from what can be identified seem to come from certain regions, but you know, it's impossible to, to tell because you know, they're, often, you know, they're often servers or providers that probably just have compromised you know, VPSs and VMs. So it makes it a bit tricky. Mm. And, and do they tend to, to hold true once, once someone pays the ransom? um yeah so the do they tend to hold true i mean it's it sort of seems that way from you know some of the ones that i've been aware of some of the bigger ones i'm um, not ones that i've the ones that i personally had dealings with um they tend not to pay the ransoms not because i say they should or shouldn't that's kind of out of my mm. um that, that's i'll leave that for the, the lawyers and stuff <laughs> um but the, the, the bigger ones that we've seen in the, in the, in the news, like, you know, even though they might not say that they did, it's kind of probably, or you know, someone's other leak that they had. And, and it seems like that that has happened where they, um, they've, you know, they paid the, the ransom and, and not that I'm suggesting that people should pay the ransom or they shouldn't, not my thing. It's not advice, <laughs> um, but um, it, it sort of seems like it's become a business. Um, and it's obviously a very lucrative one. So it kind of, and this is a, almost a little bit of a philosophical kind of statement here, but it kind of makes you wonder like if they didn't pay it, well, that's not a very good business model, is it? So um, it's kind of in there, if they want to continue that business model that they should probably provide the service that they're, um, they, that, that the victim is paying for. Market forces. As terrible as that is. <laughs> um, so I think the key here is just to make sure that doesn't happen, that you uh, don't yeah. end up um, getting ransom word and yeah okay and just just would you i suppose whether you pay or don't pay there'd never be one one rule would there no i don't think there's one rule and ultimately if you don't have to pay you definitely shouldn't so that once again goes into how important it is to be able to recover and how good your incident response plans are your your you know your business continuity plans are your backups clearly um that sort of thing mm. Perhaps a related question then. Uh, what's the break-even point for for most companies to resource an information security-focused function like a a SOC or um, security operations center, or bringing on a, a CIO? When does the cost of establishing this capability offset the risks of not doing so? Great question, Nathan. The um, so in terms of the look, I think that every organization in today's I guess climate should be um, having this type of function in some way, shape or form. Um, it just, yeah, I, I guess if the question is that, well, that's the answer to that. If the question is like, at what point do you bring it in house versus having it out? Is that what the question is? I, I guess it's, it's different for every business, but yeah, that, that would be an excellent way of framing the question. 
Yeah. So, and, and I think, you know, many smaller organizations typically don't have anyone in that. And it's hard to put like a, a sort of dollar figure on this. Um, and I think it comes down to each individual organization and, you know, and creating a business case and that sort of thing. Um, because, you know, the, the cost of setting up your own SOC um, is going to be substantial, right? Between, you know, retention and upskilling and, and all that sort of stuff, it's going to be very, very expensive. Um, when he says CIO, does he mean CISO? <laughs> Maybe um, Chief Information Officer or, or CISO, Chief Information yeah. Security Officer, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think it's important to have someone that can deal with those issues, but I think that's really a business decision. Um, I can't really say, well, this is the point that you would do that. Um, mm. But yeah, obviously outsourcing is a good model for those that haven't reached the um, size and probably, you know, have the revenue to support bringing in those sorts of professionals because, and I'm sure a good reason why a lot of, a lot of us are sitting here right now is it's a very, um, you know, it's a, it's a market that's in demand. Um, you know, it pays pretty well. Um, so, um, you know, security resources are expensive. So if you can, you know, leverage something like a, 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 a outsource SOC, um, you know, that's, that's great. I guess some of the challenges that, you know, and I've, I've been in that scenario that you have is that when you outsource, um, you know, sometimes the, you know, it might just be like a monitoring capability rather than remediation. So, and then you obviously, you do have that ability to say, oh, well, you know, they didn't do this, but that's not going to help you when you ransomware. Um, so, you know, it depends on the needs of the business really. And I think that's probably the best way to answer that. So, yeah. And there's so many different perspectives. You look at all of the different subjects you'd be doing in, in the master's studying and any certifications you might be interested in like CISM, CISP, um, they'll all have different perspectives. And um, I, I guess that's the point you, you sort of get as much or as diverse a group of opinions as you possibly can, and then try and tailor it to the, to the context that you're in at that point in time. Yeah. So I think, yeah, it's a great question, but I think it needs, um, uh, it's definitely business dependent um, on both need and, and risk. And, and you know, that's, yeah, I think that requires a whole business case. <laughs> right. Uh, Siva asks, what is data exfiltration? Okay. So that, that one, that, that one's easy. So that's, um, that's literally taking information that's within an organization and, um, I guess sneaking it out. So, you know, that's where, you know, a threat actor comes in and, you know, gets access to your systems and then steals the information for whatever purpose they want, whether they want to, you know, commit identity fraud, theft, IP theft, or um, hold it to ransom. Great. Thank you. Uh, Linda asks, how safe is it for organizations to jump into Microsoft 365 for mailing services? Um, um, yeah. So once again, I have to be careful that I'm, that I'm not providing advice on, and, and that, that's a very, <laughs> it's a very qualitative question. So as a subject to interpretation on, on how safe you think it is. Look, I, I, I think, um, you know, if you wind the clock back about 10 years, there was a lot of apprehension around moving things to cloud. Um, my, and I, and look, I had those same feelings, you know, 10, 12, 13 years ago, like oh, the cloud, you know, oh, putting my stuff in someone else's data center sounds a little bit scary. Um, so I guess where we've kind of, I guess, evolved from is that in many instances, this is their only job and Microsoft are really moving to that cloud model. So they really have to put a lot of effort and focus on security. Um, and so at the end of the day, their, their, their sort of um, requirement is to provide a service and provide a service that's secure. So, but, but, and we will cover this off, that it does depend a lot on how it's configured. And so while Microsoft, as an example, hold a lot of, you know, independent attestations and certifications and yada, 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 and they do encryption and all that sort of stuff, there are a whole bunch of things that should be done to the environment until I think I would say that it would be considered, quote, safe to use. And we are going to cover off a little bit of that. And I think and I thought was another question popped up in there before, you know, things like, you know, multi-factor things like key management. Yes, it is encrypted by default, but using customer keys, you know, that, that adds a little bit more protection on there. Um, things like using the um, cloud app security um, and the conditional access rules. It's basically locking it and tying it down and making sure that, you know, 
lease privileges in, enforced. And there's documents out there like CIS, for example, have a document called, um, they'll have documents called CIS benchmarks. And there is one for Microsoft 365. Um, and it does have a whole list in about probably 80 pages on best security practices. So, you know, take that, have a look at that, apply those as you see fit to that environment. And, um, you know, you're gonna be in a more, a more safe state than if you just spun it up and then created a few accounts and got it working. So, yeah. Good advice. Well, not quite advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, does this course cover any of the NIST functions in ISD? Um, will this course cover any of the NIST functions? Yes. So we are, and I'm assuming. Also, what, what are NIST functions? So National Institute of Standards and Technology, is that from memory? So that's the US government department. Mm. Um, it's kind of like our, sort of like our AS, well, not really like it. Well, yeah, I guess like AS, <laughs> well, ASD is Australian Signals Directorate, which is more of an intelligence agency, but they did provide, I say did, <coughs> they now have a subset called the um, Australian, um, the ACSC, um, Australian Cyber Security Centre, which provide guidance on um, uh, uh, on um, uh, like security sort of configurations of platforms. So, um, and I assume when you, are you when you talk about NIST, you're talking about like what NIST do. Yeah, I, like, I, su well, I suppose the question could be like, how much does NIST influence, for example, Australian? Uh, uh, examples of the same thing, you know, like how much does it ex influence what ASD did or do suggest in their frameworks? Well, yeah. So I guess there's two things here. So we're talking about the functions. So we're talking about the function of NIST. We're we talking about the frameworks that NIST, um, you know, supply. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to I probably want, want a little bit more on that question. Okay. So like what in this, like what in this do, or like, are we talking about the NIST frameworks and standards like, you know, cybersecurity framework or um, yeah, 8, I, 853 or 837, which is a risk management framework. Like we're we talking about that. Um, I mean, I, I guess if we talk about what their function is, they, they typically create standards that are used for um, US government systems, um, widely adopted across the globe in mm. addition to, um, just U S government. Um, so yeah. Okay. We, we will talk about some of the NIST frameworks within the course, if that helps. Uh, that, that's great for me. Um, Thomas, if you want any more, chuck something in. Um, Alan asks, why is ransomware not flooding in Africa as it is in Europe and America? Is that the case? And, and if so, why? Why ransomware is not flooding in Africa? as of Europe. So I suppose is, is ransomware targeted to, um, I suppose what you would call minority world, um, you know, rich con richer countries and um, I suppose, again, market forces. So you're saying that it is in Europe and America, but not in Africa? Yeah, it looks that way. Or is it, it's not in Africa, Europe and America? Which is obviously wrong. <laughs> That's why I'm trying to work that out. So, because, um, you know, a lot of big American companies have ended up getting become victim to it. But I think once again, it comes down, I, th I think the answer is and without knowing the official answer, but I think it's, yeah, I think it's going to be related to where um, the threat actor is more likely to get a return on investment. Great. So, you know, yeah. America, you got like a massive amount of sort of money and tech firms and, and large organizations that are probably willing to, to pay um, to get their data back. Otherwise they risk losing a lot of money and for them it might just be a drop in the ocean that's not to say there's no organizations in africa that don't have a lot of money but i think when the attack surface is a lot larger and you've got a lot larger pool to pick from you're probably going to go there john's asked the question um are you able to tell us what job prospects are available to us upon completion of a cyber security course if we are not technical personally i think george that uh cyber security is an incredibly broad um term and you can have jobs in training and education and communications and policy and all sorts of things. Um, Absolutely. I mean, the, the great the thing that I love about cybersecurity or, or information security in general is that um, 
and we, we, we've, we've had this, like as a cyber security professional, I've had this argument on my feel like since the beginning of as long as I can remember now that we, we always get kind of thrown into the IT bucket. Um, and I guess to, to a degree, I mean, we do secure IT systems, right? So that's obviously, that's why we're kind of in the IT bucket, but we also do a lot more than that. So when you think about things like, um, you know, like social engineering and, 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 and that's like a physical thing, right? Um, when you, when you look at, you know, training, um, a lot of that might be behavioral as well. So there, there's a lot of sort of personal aspects as well as technical aspects um, to cybersecurity. I think it's, yeah, it's a very, very broad industry. And so if you don't want to be, you know, a technical person or you're not that technical, um, there are certainly other areas within cyber that, um, that exist. Mm. So, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Grant followed up his question. Thanks heaps, Grant. Um, it was mentioned that rather than formal paid study, you can study under a mentor such as George. So I was wondering if there are industry mentor programs. Um, we're working on um, internships, um, but we don't have anything like that at the moment. Um, we just call our, for our lecturers mentors. It's just the way we term people. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it's all coursework. Um, but yeah, absolutely. The, the capstone subject is a, it's more of a research-based subject, so it's always really interesting. And then you can go on and do further um, research-based uh, qualifications like George has just finished. So thanks, Grant, for, for clarifying. Um, what else have we got? First of all, what's, what's OAIC? Um, that was a term Officer of the it. Australian Information Commissioner. It's the Privacy Commissioner. Okay, thanks. And and why is why is an OAIC breach report not like a duty of care where you need to report breaches in the position of third party support from heaven? Well, you need to report breaches in the position of third party support. How do we do it? Can you elaborate? <laughs> um, so we need. John's just said in the chat that's mandatory under the legislation. Um, so it yeah. is. So if, if um, under legislation, if there's a breach of personal information that is likely to result in serious harm to that individual and that, and serious harm is fairly, um, uh, what do you call it? I guess, subjective. But when we talk about things like emotional, financial, physical harm, that's kind of what they're referring to, then you need to disclose that to the um, OAIC and then there's, you know, potentially penalties of, I think it's up to 2.1 million now um, for organizations. So, and then obviously there's an investigation thing that happens with the OAIC where they look at, you know, obviously what happened and so forth. So um, yeah, it, it is mandatory that reporting does occur. Um, if it's um, applicable is not the right word, but if it falls within the requirements of the reporting, Okay, great. Got a couple of questions that are maybe a bit tangential and given the time, I might say, let's talk about that in the forum. Um, they're asking, can you tell us about your experience regarding dark web or the deep web? And also how successful is AI in cybersecurity? Have you got any good stories? Um, we might take that as questions to be answered in the forums if that's all right. Um, so, and also, cause we're, we're very close. Well, we're, after nine o'clock now, and I am absolutely busting for the loo. Uh, <laughs> what's the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption? And do you have a preference, George? Um, yeah, I mean, that sounds like someone got the CISSP textbook there in front of them. Or something. <laughs> so, um, so symmetric is really around the use of a single key. Um, so when you're doing the encryption, um, you use a single key, whereas asymmetric uses a, a key pair. Um, and so with a symmetric, with symmetric encryption, you have to conduct a key exchange. So a good example of that, I think, is maybe Wi-Fi access. Um, that's probably a good example, you know, where you have to put your your encryption key into your um, computer so that you can connect to the router and then that's all, you know, uh, all that traffic's encrypted. Whereas um, asymmetric, it's the public private key pair. And I don't have the Alice Bob diagram if anyone's seen that um, in front of me, but, um, but basically um, there's no, sort of key exchange, you, you um, I guess the, in terms of preference, it really depends on the use case, obviously with asymmetric encryption, because there's no key exchange, then you don't need to look at a secure method to transfer that key over. Um, but that is at the impact of performance. 
So if I don't care about performance then, um, and usually for like small transactions, um, I guess a good example of that is the TLS in your web browser. Um, Cause it's they're usually very small transactions. Um, I know people say, well, my internet on slow. Could it be faster if it was symmetric key encryption? Well, no, cause you've got to put the password in. Um, but um, so for those sort of, you know, transactions where performance is less important then I would use asymmetric encryption where performance is important, um, I would use symmetric encryption. So, thank you. And I'm sitting there going, I think I got those the right way around. <laughs> and finally, uh, do organized crime groups have a similar naming convention to APT groups? Bears, pandas? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I think they just name them as what they are, like, you know, the, the, the Mexican cartel. Um, so, that's, uh, I'm actually going to look, I'm going to actually go research that because I, I I'm not aware of that. I think that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I've only really associated those names with, um, you know, sort of nation, um, state sponsored groups. Um, and I, I know I did talk about the, um, specifically the sort of the pandas and the bears, um, <laughs> but there are tigers and there are other, um, animals out there. Um, there's also the use of, um, rocks. Um, so I think, one of the, it might be secure works calls like, you know, names people or names to threat actor groups after specific um, like stones and rocks and minerals. Like mm. I think, I think the U S group is platinum, I think. Um, so, but yeah, so you've got, like I said, you've got um, U S as well. You've got Iran, you've got Vietnam, you've got, you know, um, Thailand. I mean, there, there's all sorts of, nation state groups, but obviously the more prevalent ones, the ones that are more common that have a lot more groups, are, you know, three particular countries. <laughs> Beauty. If you can work out the third one. <laughs> Not right now. I need to go uh, for urgent business. Okay. Um, thanks everyone so much for hanging around. Thanks George for your um, generosity with your time tonight. Um, great first session. Um, looking forward to the rest of it. Um, thanks Hannah, Rebecca from IT masters for everything as always. Um, have fun with the quizzes um, and I'll throw to you, Joyce, to, to say goodnight. Cool. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming along and um, yeah, I will jump into the um, forums. Um, probably not tonight because it's getting late, <laughs> but I, I will over the next week. So if you've got any questions um, and I did take a copy of the, the note, the chat transcript. So I'll probably go have a look through that too. If anyone's got anything specific, um, and I'll, yeah, try and incorporate maybe some of that content into the following weeks. Great, thanks. All right, good night, everyone. Not all.